All right, well, let's stand this evening. And let's worship the Lord tonight. Well, I came to Jesus, weary, worn, and sad. He took my sins away. He took my sins away. And now his love has made my heart so glad. He took my sins away. He took my sins away. He took my sins away. And he keeps me singing. my sins away he took my sins away the load of sin it was more than I could bear he took my sins away he took my sins away and now on him I roll my every care he took my sins sins away and keeps me singing every day I'm so glad that he took my sins away he took my sins away no condemnation have I in my heart he took my sins away he took my sins away and his perfect it to me in part he took my sins away he took my sins away he took my sins away and he keeps me singing every day yes I'm so glad that he took my sins away he took my sins Christ today. He'll take your sins away. He'll take your sins away and keep you happy in his love each day. He'll take your sins away. He took my sins away. He took my sins away and he keeps me singing. sins away he took my sins away he took my sin he took my sins away he took my sins away and keeps me singing every day i'm so glad that he took my sins away he took my sins sweet and low fear not I am with thee peace be still in all of life's ebb and flow Jesus 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 sweetest name I know fills my the slumbering courts again and Jesus 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 sweetest name I know fills my every longing keeps me singing as I go feasting on the riches His sheltering wings and always looking on 
that is why I shout and sing. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sometimes the path seems rough and steep. See his footprints all the way. And Jesus, 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 sweetest name.
me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. And while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Say, Savior, oh Savior. God bless your heart. Go and greet someone and welcome them to church.
the upward way new heights i'm gaining every day still praying as i onward bound lord plant my feet on higher ground lord lift me up and let me stand Wednesday night Bible study. Don't forget coming up this Sunday morning, 9 a.m. prayer meeting. Sunday school's at 9.45, regular church at 6.30. And of course, our Monday night prayer meeting. Appreciate all those who come out this week for prayer meeting at 7 o'clock. All right, out there in the foyer is your uh, phone list. Make sure your name's on it. And if it's not, uh, get in touch with your sister Cassidy. Uh, she'll be here Sunday. And then uh, if it is, make sure it's okay. If it's good, put a check by it, and that'll help us out. Giving statements are in the foyer for you. Lauren Larson will be here March the 12th. And then our annual business meeting will be March the 28th. All right, as we go to the Lord in our prayer request tonight, uh, continue praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world, our church outreach ministries, our uh, uh, Christian school, our missionaries, praying for our country, our military, our law enforcement, uh, first responders, Israel. Uh, Mary McDonald tonight, got to touch her. Brother Alford passed away Saturday night. And uh, Sister Alford contacted us Sunday after church, and, and uh, she wanted to let you all know that she, uh, uh, they watch uh, all, the, all the services, hear their names called out, and it's been y'all's prayers that has sustained her through all this. So y'all be lifted up Sister Alford uh, uh, as she's going through a very difficult time this weekend. Uh, this week. Sister Banks, uh, also Sister Cadenhead, Gloria Johnson's entire family, uh, Sister Sandy particularly, Ben Garrett's entire family, the Jacob family, Brother James Tankersley and Sister Tankersley, Kayla McGee with her pregnancy, uh, Sister uh, Janine Walker, the passing of her mother, uh, Sister Gwen, her body continued to improve, Alicia Wicks, 
uh, needs a healing in her body tonight. Continue praying for the Nunn family, uh, Alan Edwards, also Dwayne Hastings, uh, the Braun family, continue to pray for them, uh, Kim uh, Lane's extended family, and then uh, uh, all those that have been sick and are feeling uh, ill in their body. Sister Niece is uh, out of town right now, and uh, uh, ask the Lord to touch uh, her, her mom. Also praying for uh, all those who messaged us and emailed us and requested uh, prayer requests. Un all those that watch internet, uh, our media church, and Lord touch each one of their needs as well. Unspoken requests by the raise of hands, lost loved ones. Let's all pray together as a family of believers. Heavenly Father, we thank you for every person who's gathered together in church this evening. And Lord, we lift up every name on our prayer list. Every person that God, that we lift their names up to you. We ask you to touch Sister Alfred tonight. We ask you to comfort her. We ask you to minister to her, Lord, as only you can. Fill her heart with great joy and fill her heart with great peace. Father, we ask you to touch our brothers around the world. We ask you, God, to touch our country. We're in dire straits. Touch our governor of the state of Texas. God, we ask you to touch those that have been struggling with sicknesses, those having to work tonight. We ask you to minister to them, those that are in town. We ask you to protect them. Every hand lifted up in this church tonight, Lord, the expression of faith, putting their trust in you. Lord, we ask you to minister to him as such. In Jesus' sweet and holy name, and everybody said amen. All right, all children going to uh, Sister Jenny's class tonight, come at this time. Thank you so much for bringing your, your children up with us, ministering to them. We're not babysitting them. We're putting the Word of God in them. Thank you so much for those who do minister on Wednesday night for us. And uh, it is a labor of love, and uh, we do appreciate it. Nursery workers tonight, we thank the nursery workers and uh, those and children that are in the nursery as well. Stretch your hands towards them today. Heavenly Father, thank you for these young people. We ask you to touch Sister Jeannie tonight, Sister Flair, give them patience, forbearance, tolerance, self-control. <laughs> touch these children. And everybody said amen. What's she say? I got a new something. She got a new car seat. I'm going to teach children's church one Sunday morning, and ain't nobody going to be allowed in there but me and Sister Susie. And Sister Susie's going to have a pen and paper, and I'm, each child's going to stand before me and ask them, what's your parents think about me? <laughs> Mama said, and Daddy said, oh, thank you, honey. Here's your candy cane. Hallelujah. Isn't the Lord wonderful? I apologize for my attire tonight. Uh, I don't even know who I am or where I'm at right now. But my senses will come to me, so if I get off track, Justin, say, hey, hey, get back in there. I laid down at 3.15, I think, to take a nap. I called Susie. She's out of town. I said, I'm going to shut my phone off because somebody's going to call me and wake me up. It's going to irritate the fire out of me. She said, okay, well, you'll wake up. I said, I'll wake up by 6, no problem. She said, oh, yeah. Hung the phone up, went to sleep. I woke up, kind of dazed, noticed it was getting dark, and realized it gets dark about 5.45, 5.40. Then I realized church was at 6, not 7. I told Susie I'd be up by 6, surely, because I could get ready and be over the church by 7. I mean, y'all want to know what time I rolled out of bed? 548. That's correct, mother. <laughs> Ooh. Rolled out of bed, dark in my room. I started looking for something to throw on. I threw my ranch clothes on because that's what was on the floor. <laughs> Ran over there to the turn the water on, threw some water in my hair, tried to comb it. Took off to the door, spray some cologne that was on the counter. It was mine. <laughs> <laughs> Jumped in my truck and do not remember driving over here. <laughs> Walked in here in a daze. Whew. How many of y'all want to have a prayer meeting? <laughs> oh, we're going to get in it. All right. Praise the Lord. I was up last night to 3.30 in the morning out in the pasture watching a heifer. And heifers are tricky, and sometimes they look like they're calving, and sometimes 
They don't, and when they don't, you go out there and they done did, and, and when they do, you sit there all night long waiting on them. So I sat out there at 3.30 this morning. It was cold out there last night. Sister Susie had an idea about 1.30, we was freezing. After we got a blanket from Jan, was wrapped up in a blanket sitting out there. I said, this is stupid. <laughs> she said, well, let's go get the truck. I said, I can't bring my ranch truck out here because all the cows will get up and run all over the ranch truck because I feed off of it. She said, well, let's run back home and get the brown truck. I said, that's a thought. So I run. We drive back here, jump my brown truck, drive back out in the pasture. So we start sitting in the truck. And next thing I know, I look over. Susie's gone. <laughs> She's sleeping. Just gone. I'm sitting there. I start, I'm just staring at her, just waiting for something. <laughs> and how many of y'all realize in the dark, things start moving around, ain't there? <laughs> I stare, you stare at something, I learned this more, you stare at something too long in the dark, it starts moving around. I started looking. I said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, looking good. I said, oh, I see, I see something. Okay. Glad in my eyes. Goat weed was moving in the wind. <laughs> that old goat weed, she's laying by a goat weed, and that wind was blowing that goat weed back and forth. <laughs> so 3.30, the cow was asleep. Susie was asleep. I said, this is stupid. She ain't ready. So I went home, and I went back out. Hey, Brother Gary, I didn't, know you. I didn't notice you here, bro. See what we do on Wednesday night? <laughs> then uh, we got home. I got in bed about 3 30, 3 40, something like that. And I uh, got up at 7, went back out there. She still hasn't calved. So Susie went to see Bethany. So I laid down, took a nap about 3 15. I'd still be sleeping right now if, <laughs> if I didn't wake up and realize church was going on. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Finishing up Beatitudes for you tonight. Verse 1, we'll run through them real fast and then we'll. Conclude with them. First of all, let me say that the Beatitudes is, uh, what's that word mean again? Statement of blessing. How many of y'all, how many of y'all want to be blessed? Yes. First and foremost, you ought to understand every bit of this is Christ's character. Number two, every bit of this is afforded you because of him being crucified. So all of this is, is evident. All of this is going to be pre Now remember, this is pre taught prior to the cross, right? They, not, they can't possess this in their heart prior to the cross. Does everybody understand that? Can't possess all these things. You can't possess it without putting your faith in Christ and who he is and what he's done for you at the cross. Because it's not your character neither. It's his. But it's his character that he's going to give to us as we cry out to him post-cross. After the cross. Amen? He's teaching it. This is what's going to be blessed after I'm crucified. These are, you're not going to be blessed by the law. You're not going to be blessed because you're a Jew. You're not going to be blessed because you're children of Abraham. You're going to be blessed because I'm going to be in you. Ain't that wonderful? So all this, this, whole, this whole blessed part, this whole uh, uh, characteristic list is what's going to happen to those listening to him that are going to be born into the kingdom. Ain't that wonderful? So when you look at this and you say, ooh, I need to grow in that one. Well, you can't force yourself to grow in anything. The branch produces this as the branch, produ pro as the branch produces these characters and is blessed by these characters, by the manifestation of this character, because of who the vine is. So you put your trust in the vine. So remember, this is pre-cross teaching of a, of a manifestation post the cross, after Christ crucified. Everybody see that? These people don't know that because they don't understand it yet, but they're going to. So when we look at it, he says, He opened his mouth, he taught them, saying, verse 3, going into verse 3, He's blessed the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So he's talking to people that are going to be after the cross, blessed because the dependency is on him and him crucified. They have no self-worth. Now, prior to this, he's talking to people who think they're right with God because they're Jews. Remember, he's, talk, he's talking to Jews here. He's not talking to Gentiles. He's talking to Jews whose righteousness is within the keeping of the law. 
whose righteousness is because of their bloodline, whose righteousness is because of their nation is Israel, because their father down the lineage is Abraham, and Abraham is blessed, so therefore they're blessed. Everybody see that? He's saying, you're, going to, you're not going to be blessed. You Jews are not going to be blessed because of Abraham. You're going to be blessed because of me. Yeah. Ain't that wonderful? So you can't trust in else. So blessed is poor in the spirit. And we went in detail that last week. Poor in spirit means I have nothing to offer. I have no self-worth in the sense of no righteousness to offer God. And I'm completely, holistically trusting in who he is and what he's done for me. They're going to be blessed. Because you can't really be, you can't be saved without coming to Christ this way. Because if you come to God and offer up your righteousness as a means of being right with Him, he, even though you're religious, even though you're in the church, even though you may teach behind a pulpit, even though you may sing, even though you may teach Sunday school, even though you, you may be credentialed, you will never be blessed by God because you're full of pride and you're offering up God who you are and what you do rather than who Christ is and what He's done. So you will not be blessed. You Jews won't be blessed. You're going to have to empty yourself of you and what you've trusted in and embrace me. Everybody see it? Light bulb, come on. Some of y'all looking at me like, no. <laughs> Moving on. He says, blessed are they, who they, they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourning is, and we went over this, so I'm not going to go into it. Death. Mourning is because your own sin. Mourning is because, yes, it's because of the sins of the world, but if you, you can gripe about Biden and you can gripe about Biden administration and you can gripe about the people that put him in office, and we, and we should. But, or, and you can mourn over it, like, oh, well, sweet G. I've talked to people, and God told me that, boy, we're in trouble. I said, mm hmm. But the true mourning should be understanding how far away you really are. I talked to a young man the other day in my office to about 1130 at night. And he told me that he's a pastor. He told me that uh, he's, he has found, um, he thought he was somebody. He thought he knew what he was doing. He thought he could pastor. He thought he could, he's highly educated individual, very educated, very educated very smart in scripture and he says all I do is find myself on the floor curled up crying out to God saying I don't know what I'm doing and I said you are exactly where you need to be he thought that was bad but I told him I said no that's exactly where you need to be if you wasn't there I'd be worried and he admitted he thought that he was this blessing to God because of his great study that God's going to be using because of his, uh, yeah, but his, his uh, discipline or, or his achievement of intelligence. And then he found out, I can't even pastor that small group of people good. <laughs> Amen. Do you realize the closer you get to God, but do you know how you get close to God? Through Christ. So the more you trust in the vine, the more... God is revealed to you. The vine reveals God to you through the branch. You're the branch. God's, Christ is the vine. The Father is the husband, right? So the Father, if, the, if you want to know the Father, you're going to have to get it from the vine. <laughs> Nothing wrong with great scholary, right? Nothing wrong with scholary, but without the relationship with the vine, it's, it's just noise, right? So... The closer, and what he's doing is God's breaking him, and God's putting him on the floor, and showing him, and he, and instead of bowing up, he's humbling himself. Do you know that you can't even humble yourself without God doing it? God has the vine has to teach the branch. The branch doesn't teach itself. Everybody see that? The branch cannot ed educate itself in the things of God. The vine has to because the vine is God in flesh. So, so he's being taught by the Holy Spirit, depend on me, not your scholarly. There's nothing wrong with scholarly. We need scholarly. We need to rightly divide the Word of God. But without humility, it's, it's no good. Right? Because the anointing is what breaks the yokes. The anointing is going to prick your heart. Not because he can tell you Hebrew and Greek and all those fancy words. Because all of us 
country folk around here would go, we'll be like, okay. Somebody interpret that. He's speaking in tongues. <laughs> and he's just simply reading Hebrew and Greek. <laughs> Sounded spiritual to me, brother. It had, kind of had to <laughs> in the voice there, you know. And, but anyway, he'd been, so, so, bless, bless, so you should mourn because of your sin. You should be mourning because of your, so what I'm trying to say is the closer you get to God, the more you actually see how undone you really are. You're not to catch me out like you think. Therefore, it should bring you to mourning. It should bring you to realization. It should bring you to the point, as I'm not above it, please, God, keep me from it. God, help me, please. God, let me not go down that road. God, I, am, I see that I am capable of sinning against you. Peter thought he wouldn't sin against him because Peter trusted in who he was. Right? Peter trusted who he was. Bless God, I ain't going to jail. I'll die with you. I love you. I'm going with you. But when it boiled down to it, his heart failed him. His spirit was willing, but his flesh was weak. That's what Jesus said. His spirit is willing, his flesh is weak. Right? And so because of that, you, you, you're, you're closer to falling by saying, I won't sin against God. You're closer to falling that way than saying, God, keep me and help me. Lord, let me not have that attitude. Let me not have those thoughts. Let me not walk down that road. So the closer you get to God, the more he shines on you. He shines on you and exposes who you really are. How many of y'all realize a, 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 an infection needs sunlight? If you keep it hidden in the dark, it festers and gets worse and gets deeper, right? But once it's exposed, then healing can start. So the, the Holy Ghost, it may bring you to mourning, but it's healing. It may bring you to cry out to God and say, God, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't even, I, do y'all, can y'all look back at your, since you've been saved, how stupid you were? <laughs> how, you, how you thought you knew something, but you was actually, oh my Lord. <laughs> look, I can look back in my Christian walk. And see pride and see st stupidness. How in the world did God put up with me? Amen? Well, he loves us. And he knew it was all there anyway. And his seed is in you. His DNA is in you. And his, his love is in you. And he just don't throw you away. He's in the business of saving the ungodly and making them conduct themselves as godly. Teaching them. Ain't that wonderful? Things we've said, attitudes we've had. Amen? Man, I was, thank you, Lord, for not letting me stay like that. Do you know there's people that, are, that have been in church for 40 years and they're in the same condition they were after being saved two years? They ain't grown at all. They got the same attitude, the same hang-ups, going around the same mountain because they will not humble themselves and cry out to God and mourn and say, Lord, forgive me for that. They think they're okay. Remember the man, that, the two men that Jesus uh, says, this one man comes up and he's he, before the Lord and he can't even look up to God and he's, and he's striking his chest was a sign of repentance in Jewish tradition. And he can't want him to look up to the Lord and, and he's saying, Lord, forgive me a sinner. Have mercy on me a sinner. Right? And then the other guy who, who's, who's a, a religious man and a very good man publicly and wonderful, he starts listing all his accolades of the things, of characteristics and, and his products that he does for God's name. I do that. He lists for the Lord. That's a foolish thing to do. They make a list to God. You owe me. Look what I'm doing for you. Look what I've done. You owe me salvation. Look what, I'm glad I'm not like that man. That's what he says. I'm glad I'm not like that man over there. Boy, I got, I got it going on. I give half everything. I mean, I'm just this wonderful. You're lucky to have me on your team. Jesus said, I, I tell you the truth. That man gets up righteous. Why? Because his sin and his, his relationship with God brings him to understanding of who he really is. And brings mourning to his heart, which leads to repentance, which leads to righteousness. And his self-righteousness leads to pride and unrepentance. That man is more wicked in the eyes of God than that man ever thought about being. Remember he said, I didn't come to heal the, 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 the whole but the sick. 
The, uh, the, the, the healthy doesn't need a physician, only the sick do. You know who he's talking to? He's talking to the leadership of the Jews. He's, in other words, he, I come to heal the, uh, the broken. I come to heal the unrighteous, not the self-righteous. Why can't God heal the self-righteous? Because they won't ever come to it. They won't repent. They won't come to the cross and be blessed on this side of it. Blessed on this side of the cross was under the law. Blessed on this side of the cross is faith in Christ. This side of the cross was Judaism. This side of the cross was keeping the law of Moses. This side of the cross was, was the feasts and, and all the, the, uh, the traditions of Israel, being born through Abraham and, and uh, faith in uh, Yon Kippur, or Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. This side of the cross is keeping the days and the feasts. This side of the cross is only faith in Christ. Don't add nothing to it, and the blessings come from that. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. He goes on and says this, so the morning brings repentance. And uh, you kind of, it's kind of cool because you look at them, they kind of bounce off each other. He says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Jesus is meek. We're not meek. Jesus is meek. So post cross to be blessed, meekness is blessed. Meekness is the manifestation of Jesus' character. Meekness is not timidity. Meekness is a gentle spirit gentle heart that doesn't mean you're a wimpy person doesn't mean that you're timid doesn't mean that you uh, can't correct things doesn't mean that you can't stand up for injustice it means that that you're gen you have a gentle spirit but at the same time you will not budge on the on the uh, uh, the righteousness or the principles of God the meekest manifestation on earth got mad at the Jews and flipped tables and whipped the people's flesh. But it was righteous because they were deserved it. Make sense? His meekness kept him from destroying all of Israel when he got come to the cross. He could have killed everybody there. He, he even said, my father sent legions of angels. What do you think they were going to do? Sit down and have supper? No, they were going to show up and wipe everybody out. There would be no Israel left. And the only person left standing would be Jesus and his selected disciples. That's it. But his meekness, his gentle heart, the whole reason he's going to the cross was to save them. So the obedience to God produced meekness in his heart. Jesus the man. Ain't that wonderful? Okay, we went, we went over that last week too. All right, here we go. Now we're going into the new stuff. Verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. All right. Oh, Pentecost. It's taken this completely out of context and said this means the baptism of the Holy Spirit with initial physical evidence speaking in tongues. The, more, the reason why you're not baptized in the Holy Ghost yet is because you're not hungering and thirsting after Christ holiness enough. When you start thirsting after holiness enough and start crying up to God for holiness and start living holy, then God's going to baptize. The, 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 the result of it is he's going to fill you. Blessed are they, he said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after us, for they shall be what? Filled. What, are they, what were they teaching for years and years and years, even in this church? Years and years and years and years. Filled with, what does it mean? Filled with the Holy Ghost, evidence speaking in tongues. The blessing is the baptism of the Holy Ghost because of your desire to live holy and separated from the world. So the more you're in the altars crying out to God for holiness, and the more you submit to holiness, the better chance you're going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. What's, he, what's holding you up from being filled with the Holy Ghost is because you're not trying to live holy. You're trying to have one foot in the world and one foot serving God. That is completely unbiblical. Completely unbiblical. Why? Because that scripture doesn't mean that at all. It was taken out of context. I don't know who did it, but somebody, somebody did it. You've been in any kind of Pentecostal church long enough, you've heard that. You've heard that preached. I've heard it preached and said, amen, brother. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I'm speaking in tongues. I'm a possession of righteousness. Which well, that attitude produced what? Pride. Pride. I'm better than all them other jokers. I'm holy. 
I walk in, everybody goes, hey, that's Brother Nisa, that's holy man. And you feed off of it because you like it. Because you're, everybody looks at you as some kind of thing when you should be mourning for who you really are. So that scripture doesn't mean that at all. So let's see what it does mean. I, now the people that taught that, they weren't evil. They just weren't right. <laughs> does everybody understand that? It put a lot of people in bondage. Bondage. And because I'm not filled with the Holy Ghost because of me. I'm not good enough. God baptizes people in the Holy Ghost because of faith. Not good enough. None of us are good enough. It's faith. The same faith that, that baptizes you is the same faith that saved you. He said, I will baptize you in the Holy Ghost. Do you mean to tell me that Peter goes from, with the disciples, goes from one minute denying him and leaving and going fishing, minding his own business, going back to his trade and self-dependency, and the next thing you know, what, 40 days later, 50 days later, 40 days, 40 days later, because Jesus appeared to him 40 days, I think, somewhere along that. I ain't here yet. <laughs> anyway, 43. Next thing you know, he's in this upper room praying, and all of a sudden, God says, you are righteous now because of you went to prayer meeting. There's people that preach that if you don't go to prayer meeting, you're not going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And the reason they got filled with the Holy Ghost is because they were in prayer meeting. Them joggers could have been sitting on a boat and it would have happened. He was coming. And he wasn't coming to the upper room. He was coming where they were. They just happened to be in the upper room. So don't think if you go out in the upper room, God's going to move closer. <laughs> if you, <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> oh, my. If we can just get to that upper room, do you think God's going to move on you more if you went to Israel than here? No, you're just going to be inspired more. You're just going to be more emotional. But God's not going, God don't pick Jerusalem to move on you more. It's, if the disciples were on a boat sitting there in their underwear, they would have been filled with the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost coming no matter what. And he went right to where the faith was. And where they were is where the, the faith I'm not saying this is what happened, okay? I'm just trying to show you something. So the Holy Spirit comes from the Father and the Son, correct? So he's coming to earth in a way that he's never been here to fill us and empower us. He couldn't come in us before. He could only come on us. Now he's coming in us. So who's he looking for? So look at it like this. He's coming from heaven, flying straight to the earth. He's looking for a vessel that's been washed in the blood of Jesus. And he went straight to him like a magnet, metal to magnet. Ain't that wonderful? Amen. Hallelujah. So let's see what it really means. All right, this is post-cross, right? Post-cross. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Who's the righteousness? Blessed are those that are born again that's what that means why were you when you when you cried out to the lord for salvation what did he give you he gave you christ the, be, the best gift you can ever receive is christ because you can't come into the kingdom without christ right all these blessings is because of who Christ is and what he done for you at the cross, which brings you, that brought you into the kingdom of God through faith in Christ. Amen? So the righteousness you possess, when you start crying out to God, that righteousness is a person. It's not an it. It's a person. It's Jesus. So that 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 so you are blessed as a born again child of God with what are you blessed with? We know Christ, but what does the scripture say when you're born again? Whose righteousness do you get? You are imputed with his righteousness. And because you're imputed with his righteousness, you are now a son and daughter of God with full privileges the same as the son of man no different we just don't know how to act like it not act like it with the right attitude act like it coming to my daddy's house you know my kids 
if they play the cards right, they get anything they want. They just got to play by daddy's rules. What's daddy's rules? Show a little love. Betty figured it out real early. All she had to do was climb up in my lap, pooch her lip out. Daddy, I need a new Barbie. <laughs> now, I know she, need, she didn't need no new Barbie because she already had 50 of them girls in a box, big chested, big gigantic box. You never seen so many nude women in a room. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> There's Barbies everywhere. Barbie who, Barbie here, Barbie blonde, Barbie blackhead. I mean, just tons of Barbies. Now, did she need another Barbie? No. Did it hurt her? No. Why did I do it? Dote on her. Just because I'm daddy. Everybody see that? You're not knocking on his door right. You coming to him like this. No daddy wants their children to come to him like this. Amen? I can get on white, get on to him, and he just looks at me, smiles, chawy popo, climbs right back up in my lap after I just swatted his bottom. Ain't that crazy? Swat his bottom. Tell him I love you, but don't whoop your bottom every time. Jump shot popo, climb in my lap, and just lay his head on my chest. Do I push him off? No, you got to earn your right to be on my lap with good deeds. You got to get on, you, you want to be on my lap? You want my love? You're going to have to be a good person. We teach our kids that all the time. Make good grades, I'll buy you a bicycle. Just buy them a bicycle anyway. You're their daddy. Maybe they can't make good grades. Maybe you ought to sit down and help them. <laughs> I, I used to do that. Clean your room. You're not going to. Are you going to clean your room if you get something or not? It's the right thing to do. i get you something just because I'm your daddy. And daddies love to dote on their children and grandchildren. Right? We, we, what, who do we serve? A loving, giving father. It would hurt my feelings if my kids looked at me like this. Because that's not how I feel towards them. Mm -mm. That's right. They don't know him. Ella comes to my office. She sneaks around the corner. I know she's there. I can hear her walk up the stairs. I can hear people walk up my stairs. So don't walk up there and try to listen to my, what's going on in my office because I heard you. Some of you kids are sneaky, and I know who you are, and I know what you're doing. Anyway, so Ella sneaks around the corner. She peeks, and she runs over to the chair and hides behind the chair. I act like I don't know she's there. And she comes up, and she goes, boo. I'm like, I knew you was there the whole time. Anyway, so she comes up, and I said, come here, give me a hug. Mm -mm. I said, come on. I said, give me a kiss right there. Uh-uh. And she'll come up, hug me. She wanted the attention. She never would have went up there. So I got candy in my drawer. So I pulled my drawer out, candy cane. I said, you want candy cane? She said, right there, chick. And she kisses me. She smiles, she hops and goes off. Why? Because they need to be able to feel fr The kids are in my office after church. All the time. It's packed with little children. Don't believe me. Ask the people to come up to my office after church. They go up there. I, why do they do that? They shouldn't be allowed to go to the pastor's office. No, they should feel comfortable 100% to be able to walk into their pastor's office and go in there and laugh and talk and, and get a candy cane or whatever and go in there and hug me after church and tell me bye. Because they need to feel approachable at that age and when they're in their 20s and Satan screwed them up, they can still feel approachable to come to Brother Matt. Now, so you should feel approachable to come to your father, not by works, but because of love. None of us deserve to be in his presence. We are in his presence because of self or because of imputed righteousness. It's the only reason why you're there. 
that's the only reason why you're there. Go back up to poor in spirit. The only reason why you're there is because of imputed righteousness, not because of yours. Amen? Not because you've earned anything. You're there because who Christ is and what he's done for you and your faith in Christ gives you a band to be a, a keys, to the, keys to heaven to where you can come right into the very presence of your heavenly Father and make your petitions known and be comforted and loved and doted on because you're his kid, you're his child. So don't ever, don't. And what do people do when they sin? What do people do? When, when they get upset, they flee God. They run from God. And the first place they run from God from is the local church. Because this is where they're getting a daddy, do daddy dose. What's a daddy dose? <laughs> Interpret that. Steady dose of the Word of God. Why run from that? Run to it. The Word of God exposes all of us. You ain't the only one getting exposed, sister. We're all, I sit there and read the Bible and go, Ugh. Man, you know, if we were God, we'd just smoke everybody and start over. I would. I'd just smoke them out, just poof, start completely over. Right? He offered it to Moses. He offered it to Moses. Do you know that was a test for Moses? That's a great sermon. That was a test for Moses. It wasn't about Israel. God already knew what was in their heart. God already knew that, what? Can't do that and interrupt my church service. That was a, that, they are, God already knew they was going to do what they did. He still brought them out of Egypt. God already knew they was going to build that golden calf. God already knew that they were going to do what, act the way they were acting when, when Moses was up there with them. He said, Want me to kill them and start over a new? I'm gonna. He didn't ask me. So I'm just gonna kill them and start over a brand new nation, just for you. See, if Moses didn't realize, if the Moses prior to the forty years in the desert said, "Kill them," and that's how we all start off, kill them. But then Moses remembered who he was, and after forty years of the desert, he's like, "Oh." No, think about it like this. You brought them out to the desert to kill them rather than glorifying yourself. It would be better for you to glorify yourself and keep them. See, Moses, God's test to Moses, is this about you or is this about me? Is this about you achieving a level of self-worth or is this all about me? It's all about God. Moses was, more, Moses was more concerned about God being looked at wrong than being vengeanced by God against people that ticked him off. <laughs> you know as well as I do, there's times in our life we just said, smoke them suckers, boy. Who do they think they are talking to me in that attitude? <laughs> I did all I could do to help them, and this is what they did. I'm gone. Just look at them. Go ahead, God. Kill him. Noah had that attitude, didn't he? I mean, not Noah, I'm sorry. Uh, Jonah. Jonah had that attitude, didn't he? Jonah said, y'all finna burn. Oh, by the way, y'all might want to repent because he's finna smoke you people. Have a nice day. He wants to go sit up on a high hill and go, this is going to be good. <laughs> Why? Because he hated them. Rightly so. They were evil and ungodly and debauchery and, and were enemies of Israel and butchered Israel's people. Sm we'd all be up there. Smoke them, God. Don't be hard on Jonah. Don't be hard on him. We'd done the same thing. I'd have been up there and said, y'all finna fry. Bunch of ungodly lot. <laughs> Gonna be good. Anybody want to watch? Here we go. It's coming. And then all of a sudden, nothing happened. I'm like, Where's the fireworks? And the Lord taught him with the gourd. Amen. He said, Should I, what did the Lord say? First of all, the king recognized Jonah was there. He said, ooh, we better repent. And he commanded the whole nation of Nineveh to repent with sackcloth and ashes. And God saw it. Do you know that whole story is all about Noah? I mean, Jonah. To show us attitude. It's all about Jonah. It's all for us to see. Amen? 
They repented. He didn't want them to repent. He wanted them to get smoked. And the Lord said to him, the Lord looked at Jonah and said, should I have mercy upon those who don't know their left hand from their right? <laughs> they don't know me at all. And yet they repented to me because of your words. You should be rejoicing. Instead, you're mad. And another thing, I love this part, much cattle. In other words, all them cattle, all them sheep, all them livestock, they finna burn too. Because judgment just doesn't come on the person that comes on the house. Your poor kitty cat gonna smoke too. Yeah. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That's post-cross. That's being born again and imputed righteousness from God. Then it says, blessed are the merciful. That Jonah message is great for mercy. Merciful. For they shall obtain mercy. How many of y'all want mercy? It's, but the, here's the thing. It's already, you've already been given mercy. Because Jesus showed mercy. Ain't that wonderful? Jesus showed mercy or you'd have never come to him. Ain't that wonderful? You're blessed because Jesus showed mercy upon us. God showed mercy upon us. So automatically this born-again experience is going to put in us a new attitude of mercy. You, you should know through the time of being born again, you're a whole lot more merciful than you ever were before. There should be a distinction. As you grow in God, there should be a great distinction between the attitude and characteristics of sons of Adam and sons of God. I mean, we're not perfect. That's because we need. That's why we need grace. Just as much grace now as we did before we got saved. We live. In, we live in corrupt bodies. We live in bodies of, of, of mortal mortal bodies that still has a sin nature that that we still have to keep crucified through faith in Christ, not by gritting your teeth, but faith. Lord, keep this thing. You're the only one that can keep it in the ground. Right? He's the only one. Hallelujah. I mean, we have a, a free will, but my free will, instead of gritting my teeth, my free will chooses to cry out to God and say, oh, Lord, help me. My free will is to put, plant my face, help me, my Father, knowing I can come to him and he's not going to kick me out. He's going to hold me and say, I know. Ain't that wonderful? Yes. So mercy is going to flow from us because Christ showed mercy in us and it's going to come from us. If your lack of mercy, it all speaks of your relationship with the vine. That vine is a merciful vine. Amen? And we have to be, not, no, that doesn't excuse, mercy never says that we reject the, the, the uh, principles of God. We don't reject God's word in the name of mercy. That's, that's opposite of God. His word is what brought mercy. But we don't change his word. In other words, mercy doesn't change the word of God so you feel good about yourself living in sin. Mm -mm. That's not biblical. Number eight, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Who's the pure in heart? One's born again. Ain't that wonderful? Doesn't mean you're perfect. It means you have new DNA. It means that you've been born again. You're a different person. And those of you that come from, from a horrific past or a long past of sin can see that. My heart's different. It's completely different. Those of you who've been saved for a long time, forget that. That's why I'm always telling you the worst thing that ever happened to us is to forget where we came from. Forget where God brought us from. Forget what we could be. I mean, look at Justin. If God didn't save Justin, he could be in some washed-up band trying to call themselves stripper or striper too. <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> striper two band playing the drums for striper two band is <laughs> unsaved with with mascara and long hair, and instead he's in church playing for God. <laughs> Ain't God wonderful? So if some dude walks in from an old washed out striper two rock band with long hair and that mascara on his eyes, Justin should be the number one person to embrace him and say, man, I'm glad you're here. The rest of us go, oh my. <laughs> 
Don't you know the Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair? Who are you? Are? Who are you? <laughs> Justin, I used to have long hair. You did? Good. Okay, eyeliner, it's all the same to me. <laughs> With a bandana on his head. But at least it wasn't on his leg. That's back, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Back in the 80s. Mama, did I ever try to go to school with a bandana on my leg? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Well, if Daddy said no, I'd just put it on in my truck when I got on the driveway. How many of y'all ever pushed your vehicle out of the driveway with it off in the middle of the night? Yeah, boy. <laughs> Why? Sister Tina. Why? Because you knew you couldn't with fire that sucker up at 1 o'clock. Somebody's going to hear it. So we should be merciful when loved ones do stupid stuff. <laughs> hey, I got to tell you a story. I wanted to go out with my friends. They all said, hey, let's go. About 1 o'clock in the morning. I went and asked Dad about 10. Can I go? He said, no. I said, you don't understand. <laughs> they got girls there. <laughs> Can I go? No. I said, oh, fine. Went in my room, shut the door, pouted. All my friends going to think I'm a dork. I didn't have a vehicle yet. <laughs> How many of y'all realize we do some stupid stuff? <laughs> so when your kids do stupid stuff, Remember that, how stupid we were. So Matt goes, Captain Nice's door shut. That's bad. <laughs> Don't, that's bad. About 1230-ish, I knew they were all to go. They were all waiting on Matt, life of the party, right? <laughs> I crawled on my hands and knees <laughs> along the edge of his bed. He would move, I'd stop. <laughs> I look like a cat, Jack. <laughs> you ever see a cat trying to go towards his prey? At me. I had cat-like reflexes. Don't. Now, I'm laying right here. My daddy's head is right here, and his arms are right here. That's death if he woke up, Jack. <laughs> I mean, you finna die. You f <laughs> that must have been some serious partying going on for me to risk my life. <laughs> Guess whose keys are in his ashtray on his nightstand? Daddy's. <laughs> I'm talking kitty cat, man. Claw. And daddy has about 20 keys on his key ring. Not just one, not just a key, bunch of them in a glass ashtray. Bad, bad, bad. And mama's laying there, daddy's laying there. Bad, bad, bad. <laughs> Pitch dark. No noise. Little, just one little ting, ting. I'm like, I'm waiting for the hammer. <laughs> Success. I crawl backwards. Slip out the, I mean, what's the chances of not running into the door in the dark? Slip out. Shut his door. We have cell phones, people. I'm just... I go out the front door, put the key in, put it in neutral. I push that white Chevrolet out of his driveway. Hey, son, I need you to help me fix the tire. No, oh, Daddy, I, I can't do that. But I can push that truck out of the driveway, brother, nine. <laughs> push that joker on, out in the driveway, got on the road, turned the keys on, took off. I come, go out, I come back, and old dummy here, Puts the keys on the bar and goes to bed. <laughs> bad. If you're going to be bad, be good at it. Be good at it. Hide your stuff. So I get up. We're eating breakfast. Daddy says, where'd you go last night? I'm like, What do you mean? I know you left last night. Where'd you go? Out with the, out with the guys. 
He said, you come and got my keys out of the room, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, he could have killed me right there and then. And I don't understand. Captain Neese can do that and has many times. I mean, thank God for Mama. He went to whip me in the second, I was in the second grade and got lied on in front of his family up in Oregon. He went to spanking me in the bathroom. My grandmother said, Bill, that's enough. Thank you, Grandma. <laughs> I'm still mad about that one. But anyway, for some reason, he didn't do nothing. He didn't, he said, don't ever do that again. Said, yes. He didn't whip me. So somewhere along the line, he snuck out of his daddy's house, obviously. <laughs> and he's probably thinking, that boy did good. The only reason I caught him is because he left the keys on the bar instead of putting them back in the ashtray. Amen. And why was I telling? Mercy. Our mercy comes from knowing who we used to be and what we've done stupid. So we try to guide people not to make the mistakes. Amen. The best pastor to younger ministers is not look how holy and powerful I am. Listen, you won't make the stupid mistakes I've made. Learn what I've already learned. So you don't have to learn it. You already know it. But then there's some people who just don't listen. You have to learn for yourself. Amen. Blessed are the pure in heart. Those are the saved ones, okay? Saved. We went over that. Saved, for they shall see God, means that they're born again, and they will dwell with the Lord forever. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Jesus is a peacemaker. Peacemaker between who? Who did Jesus make peace between? I used to not like that verse because I seem to always be getting in confrontations with people over stuff. And I'd go, man, I ain't no peacemaker. Everywhere I go, it's I get in a confrontation with somebody over something. I ain't, I ain't looking for it. It's like a magnet. But that's not what it means. Blessed are the peacemakers. What are the peacemakers? How many of y'all made peace with God? Every one of you. If you're born again, through who? You didn't offer up a sacrifice. Jesus, or God offered up a sacrifice for you, and you accepted it. This is my sacrifice that I offer to you to bring peace between me and you. The peace between you and God is because of Christ. So you're blessed because you are a peacemaker because God gave you peace. Because God, there's peace between you and the Father because of Jesus. Listen, making, listen, non confrontation. Oh, I just hate confrontation. Oh, isn't they so godly? They just hate confrontation. No, that, no, 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 no. That means you're a coward. Now, not, that's not a peacemaker. You never, there's no such thing as peace between two people that are in total opposite places with God. There's no marriage peace in the house if one's serving God and one's not. There's no peace between me and you as a friend if you are pro-anti-God and I'm pro-God. Ain't got nothing to do with Trump. It's pro-God. I don't care if it was... What's that black guy over the Republican Party in Texas? It was a uh, colonel in the army. Yes, Alan West could have been president. I've been 100% supporting him. It's the principle he stands for. It's not the person. People are stupid. Oh, y'all just Trump worshippers? No, I'm not. I'm. It's the principles. It's what he stood for. He wasn't perfect, but the principles speak for me. Those are my principles. Does that make sense? So a peacemaker means that you have made peace with God through Jesus Christ. And it doesn't mean that you're going around all the time trying to be a peacemaker with people. Jesus said, think not that, I brought, that I've come to bring peace, but rather I've come to bring a sword between light and dark. A division. There's a division in the darkness. Why is there a sword in the darkness to bring a divide and no peace? Because light has shone in that darkness. So there's light and darkness. Those that choose light will never be at peace with those who choose darkness. Never. Man, you'll never even be sit to dip. You can't even eat dinner together no more. Why? Grieve you. 
their attitude and language grieves you. I talked to, to some men on the side of the road to say, hey, how y'all doing? Uh, you know, they were building a fence. I said, of course, I, I, I say stupid stuff. I said, do you ever think you'd grow up and still be building fences? <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. These grown men out building fence. And I, I drove up and stopped my truck and said, do you, th- you ever think when you grew up you'd still be building fences? <laughs> they just looked at me. And one of them said a, 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 a dirty word. It says better than building buildings. But it, the word he said grieved my heart. It's just like that. Nasty. Dirty. I used to say it every other word. That same word. Every other word. He wasn't being ugly. That's just that's who he is. Same as I used to be that way. So I don't think I'm better than him. But his spirit grieved my heart. Why? Because there's light in there. Now, if there was no light in there, it wouldn't grieve me at all. I'd just laugh and say the same thing back. You're right, man. I'm of a different nature. So there would never be peace between me and that man. Because why it would? Because every time he's around me, that's why people don't like being around you. You want to know why you don't get invited over for supper? Or you don't get invited when the family gets together? Or you get, when, not, when they all go shopping, they skip you? And you're sitting there, oh, nobody loves No, they don't love you. They'd love you fine if you acted like them. They don't like Jesus in you. You are a constant conviction to them. You're a conviction, and you ain't got to open your mouth. You just walk in the room. Oh, here comes holier than thou. I ain't have to say nothing. They just know I ain't going to do that. And if they do it, I'm going to say something. Fastest way for you to get rebuked is do something ungodly in front of my wife, my kids. I feel like God has kept me from going to prison because of that. Oh, yeah. I have unloaded on men in restaurants. One time, we used to watch the hat. We used to watch hatch. We come back through and stop the salt grass. They're in, uh, huh? Yeah, and me and Susan sitting there minding our own business. These two men sitting there talking ungodly and laughing. And one of them says, let me show you what she showed me on my, on my phone. Susan didn't hear the word. I heard it. I stuck a fork in my hand. <laughs> stood up. Maybe that was a bad man. But anyway, st- I stood up and I said real loud over the whole building, you shut your mouth right now. You're not going to talk like that in front of my wife. And both of them just looked at me. I said, I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you're talking nasty in front of my wife, and you're not going to do it. You're either going to leave or shut up. Now, it could have been a fight right then. <laughs> They'd have got forked. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what God did? <laughs> oh, we're sorry. I turned around. <clears throat> Susie looked for it. She said, I did. I, we're going to close. I left here on a Sunday night. Light and dark, Jack. I left here on a Sunday night and had a visiting minister with us. And Harless and Stephanie and his, their two sons and me and my wife and our three kids and the visiting minister, I took him to McDonald's to get him a little light snack and kids wanted McDonald's. So we left her Sunday night. So you, did you hear about that, Joni? <laughs> You was with me? Anyway, there was a group of young men walked in, and we was all over in the corner minding our own God little business. My little daughter sitting there in her little pretty little dressing bowl. And these guys all walk in, it's about 15 of them walk in, they're talking real loud and acting like a fool. And one of them starts cussing, and I just flipped. I got up, ran out, and jumped right in the middle. God help me. <laughs> he's kept me from being killed, and he's kept me from going to prison. And I said, you shut your mouth. So I'm a preacher in this town, <laughs> and y'all cussing. My family's right over there, and you're not going to talk like that again, or I'll throw you in the pit. <laughs> well, the Lord flipped the tables. So I went back over there, and, and all the companies with us all going, so I'm sitting there, I go to eating, and then they start trying to work that. Man, that guy punked you out. He punked you out. 
He punked you out, man. He's he going to throw you out the building. He punked you out. I said, Ugh. So I got back up, walked right, looked at him, and went over and ordered me a large cup of coffee. And it wasn't a drink. <laughs> and I went back over and stood right in the middle and stared at him. And you know what God did? Peacemakers. That wasn't a peacemaker. That was somebody standing up for principle. Maybe I shouldn't have got the coffee, but the point is that's somebody standing up for peace. That's, do not, you cannot think it's wrong to stand up for principle and righteousness for your family and righteousness for your, for your, for God. And think that you're supposed to walk around like this little timid coward thing all the time. No, sir. Peacemakers are people that are, this peacemaker here, are people that are born again with God. And there's peace between. If you're you're acting wrong, your Heavenly Father will let you know. But you know what my Heavenly Father did? Defused the situation to protect his child. (laughs) Ain't that wonderful? He diffused it. Ain't that, you know how many times God's protected you and you don't even know it? Now, now watch. If my wife and kids weren't there, I would have said nothing. Don't bother me. Don't, whatever, dude. But because of them, it was ungodly. Everybody see it? Now look what he says. He says, Rejo- he says blessed are you the men that shall revile you. I'm sorry, look at 10. Blessed are they that persecuted for righteous sake. For righteous sake. Not persecute you because of you doing bad things, but persecute you because you're living for God. For theirs, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because that's what they did to Christ. If Christ acted like them, the Jews that were trying, that crucified him, oh, he cru- he laid himself down. You understand that? But if he acted like them, they'd have thought him as his buddy. But because he wouldn't act like them, they wanted to get rid of him. Thus, you have Trump. The reason why they hated Trump is because they couldn't buy him and control him. That's all it is. That ain't, he did something bad. He says they can't control him or purchase him. He has his own money. And his principles go against their agenda. He says, blessed are they which, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. I'm one of the most evil people on If I was as evil as people try to say, Jesus would have to go back to the cross for me. But if I acted like everybody else acted and, and, and just laid back and went along with whatever, I'd be just a good old boy. It's better to have few friends that love God than a bunch of friends that are fake and don't love God. He goes on and says this. He says, uh, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I didn't see no, so I didn't see, you go back and read your, this is God talking to the Jews, right? Pre-cross, but post blessing. So it's for now. Go back and read your prophets. Name one that's wimpy. Name one that just went along with the crowd. Name one that just went along with government. Name one that just went along with the king. Name one that was loyal to the people over loyal to God that he's talking about. Right? Mm -mm. Elijah wasn't an ugly person. But he sure wouldn't budge. Elijah, Samuel, major prophets, minor prophets, right? Isaiah, go read them. Look, look at their character. They were, I, no, mm-mm. You know that song we sing, uh, it's like fire shut up in my bones and we all shout and dance. That fire shut up in his bones because he was rebelling against God. It's not really a shouting song. It's kind of like he was 
rebelling against God and not saying what God told him to say. And he said, man, I can't help but say it. It's like fire in my bones is killing me. I got to get it out. Amen. We like it. It's okay. We can sing it. All right. Rejoice and be sing glad because they persecuted the prophets the same way. They're going to persecute you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savior, its purpose, its taste, wherewith shall it be salted? You put salt in soup, what's the first thing you put too much of it? What's the first thing people say? Woo, it's too salty. There's no such thing as being too salty for God. Salty irritates. Don't believe me? Put it in a sore. But it also heals. That's good stuff, isn't it? Where's Brother Zach at? Hiding from me. Everybody's standing. Sorry, Joni, or Je- Jenny's going to kill me. I told her I won't be long, I promise. Well, I just woke up about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Father, we praise you, we glorify you, we magnify your name above all names. We ask you to God to teach us and guide us, direct us, protect us from sin, protect us from ungodliness. Father, we ask you, Lord, to just just teach us. Aren't you glad he don't throw you away? You know, Captain Neese is in the back of the church tonight. I'm on this side and he's on that side. The same young man that crawled across the floor to steal his truck to go be out with his friends is the same young man and and daddy standing in the same church together. (laughs) Ain't that good? Ain't that wonderful? He could have killed me. He didn't know. I should ask that, Dad. He probably did something along. He probably, he didn't steal his daddy's truck. He probably jumped on his bicycle or his little motorcycle in Phoenix and took off. (laughs) Ain't God wonderful? He sustains us. He blesses us, he loves us, he guides us, he keeps us, he don't throw us away. Amen. He heals our wounds, he heals our stupidity, even protects us from it. We owe him everything, but we can't pay him back. All we can do is what should come natural to us in our new creation and praise him. That's why heaven's not about you nor angels or wings or motorcycles or fishing or milking cows for God. <laughs> oh, I laugh because I used to say, maybe, Lord, when I get to heaven, you let me take care of your dairy or something. You know what will happen when you get to heaven? The first million years, of course, theologically, we'll be back here a thousand years and for a million years, it would never be enough for us to say thank you every day. Still wouldn't be enough. Amen? Ain't he wonderful? Just fall in love with the one who loves you. Don't run from him, run to him. Amen? It breaks his heart when you run from him. No different if it would be your own child. Hallelujah. God bless your heart. Thank you for coming. Shake hands be friendly. <laughs>